Thank you. Thank you for the kind uh, introduction. I appreciate that and the opportunity to uh, be here today in front of Biff. I can't imagine that uh, anybody's more pumped to get up here and tell you their story than I am. And uh, I'll do that right now. Behind me, uh, you see, I'd like to introduce my family to you. Uh, my beautiful wife, uh, Jennifer, is in the audience today. Thank you. My three great kids, Charlie, Harrison, and Grayson. That image right there from Disney, an image I think everybody in the audience can relate to on uh, some level, uh, one of those life moments, if you will. Unfortunately, what you don't see there is I'm having one of the worst panic and anxiety attacks that I had ever had, right there in that picture. And I was faking everybody out. I even had Mickey faked out. <laughs> everybody but me, unfortunately. And the reason is mental illness is both invisible and misunderstood, which is a really crappy combination for people like me. As my story would go, I was born here, as Saul said, in uh, Rhode Island. I went to Moses Brown, went on to Ohio State University on a tennis scholarship, where I was captain of the tennis team. And then, uh, after a successful career, um, into my family's business. And by the time I was uh, 23 years old, my mind had been taken over by these terrible racing thoughts that I was powerless, unfortunately, to control. I basically thought I was going crazy. Now, for me, I got lucky. I found my way to Butler Hospital, a leading psychiatric hospital in the country in Rhode Island, and I quickly got diagnosed with OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. And over the last 27 years, I've fought a debilitating illness every single day of my life, even as I, I stand up here in front of you today. For those of you that, that aren't familiar with this illness, um, it comes with um, recurrent, unwanted, and unpleasant thoughts. Unfortunately, that force you into levels of anxiety and panic that's almost impossible to explain. I've had so many people ask me, Jeff, what is it like? Well, here's what it's like, ladies and gentlemen. You're with your two, three-year-old child in O'Hare Airport on the, in the uh, crowded waiting area, and you turn around for a minute, and then you look back, and there's no child. I think everybody can understand at some level that level, that panic and anxiety. Somebody that has what I have can have that exact level of anxiety for hours on end over seemingly nothing. And as if that's not bad enough, it comes with the compulsions, compulsions that you feel you have to do to lower that anxiety level. And when I talk about compulsions, I'm not talking about hand washing. For me, it's, it's mental repetitions, it's visualization in my mind, things that are almost too painful to even explain to you. One of the things that, uh, that I do is I try to paint what I can't say. This image right here, Howard Hughes, it can happen to anybody. Hughes had all the money in the world. Money can't buy you out of mental illness. He suffered actually from OCD, the same thing that I did, and at the end of the day, it probably killed him because he couldn't get the help that he needed. And you see in this famous picture of Hughes in front of his pride and joy, that plane, the stop sign behind his head, trying to stop symbolically the bad thoughts, but being overwhelmed by the propeller that kept going. This illness is tricky. It goes after what you value most in life. For me, my family, my children. The name of this painting, Half Daddy. Can you imagine what it feels like for someone like myself to feel they're half there when they're with their children, lost in obsessions and compulsions? Well, the good news is for me, 16 years ago, as fate would have it, I was coming home from work one day and I was desperate. Desperate like many people that suffer from mental illness. And I decided on a whim that I would try to paint. Why not? I'm desperate. What I haven't told you is no idea how to paint, no idea how to draw, just desperate, so you try stuff. So I ended up picking up some paints and I think everybody in the audience has probably seen Forrest Gump and how he ran. Well, as you can see, I've become the Forrest Gump of painting. And a, a, a bunch of things happened for me. You know, first was I, I gained a sense of control that mental illness robs you of. The second thing was it provided me some peace of mind, peace of mind that I was so desperate for, even for fleeting moments. Third, 
It provided me a blank canvas, if you will, to capture my own creativity and vision, which I only was looking for not only in my personal life, but in the business world as well. As we all know, you can be doing what you do exceedingly well and you can't control what happens. But when I painted, I was in control. And that was invigorating to my soul. And fourth, and certainly most unexpectedly, I was pretty good at it. You know, and that, that certainly uh, came as a shock. And over the years, my, my work has found its way into galleries around the country, private collections, as people have connected with my story, my self-taught style, my unconventional work, my faceless characters. Don't tell anybody I can't draw a face, please. <laughs> and it got to the point where um, people were paying a lot of money for my work and I was uncomfortable. So I asked my cousin Matthew, who's in the crowd today, who had a, I was a marketing company at the time, I said, Matt, do me a favor. Can you handle the business transaction of this for me? I was a little embarrassed. He, and Matt, he wasn't bashful. Two months later, we were having a one-man show. And that evening, at the end of the show, Matt comes up to me and he says, Jeff, you're not going to believe this, man. He says, we sold $15,000 artwork tonight. I said, wow. He says, what do you want to do? I said, I don't know. I said, I paint. It makes me feel good. Maybe it'll help others. That's it. Two weeks later, we showed up at a psychiatric unit at a children's hospital. A sad place if you haven't been there, and I've been there many times. With nothing but a duffel bag of blank canvases and foam brushes in our bag and just the, the hope to maybe to do something special. And from the first day, ladies and gentlemen, we knew we had something. I'll never forget a young man, Jordan, frozen over his canvas. Picture this, if you will, just like this. And I turned to Matt and I said, what the heck do I do? I'm not a doctor, I'm not an artist, I'm a nobody. Just somebody who wanted to help. So I figured I'd do the only thing I knew to do. I told these kids my story. And I gave them some hope and some optimism. And as we sat there, I go around to the kids and I said to this young man, Jordan, joking, I said, what's the name of that painting you're doing? And he goes to me like this, money. And I said to the guy, I said, did he just say that? I said, what did you say that money that is? He says, it's money. Well, you know the story. Over the next 20 minutes, that young man's head came up. It was almost like an awakening for those of us that were there that day, including the therapist that probably had never seen anything like that. And as I went to my car that evening and sat in the parking lot crying, as I do often after these classes, I thought that we had something special, something that was part inspirational, part motivational, part you can do it, part there's a hope for a better tomorrow. Over the last three years, this program, which we call Paint for Peace, we've brought to over 8,000 people. I personally have taught that program in every possible demographics that I can find. Boys and girls clubs, children's units, high schools, colleges, advanced Alzheimer's unit. It's even made its way into corporate uh, boardrooms. And we've seen I have seen the power of art to heal firsthand. And I could sit here, if you all want to miss lunch, we could skip it and I could tell you these stories and I'll probably have you all cry. <laughs> but I know everybody's hungry. But I could tell you about the eight-year-old who spends 50 minutes with me and tells me it's the best day of his life. Now, whether he thinks it's the best day of his life, ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't matter. He thought it was. I could tell you about the father who puts his hand on my shoulder only like a father could and thanks me. Thanks me not only for giving relief to his child, but for providing some peace of mind for he and his wife who suffer along with their child. And I can tell you about the 52-year-old woman that suffers from anxiety and depression, who came up to me and told me that she had been so inspired that she was going back to the University of Rhode Island to get her art degree. And I can tell you about the executive that, from Disney who came up to me after my speech at Hallmark and said, hey, Jeff, my brother. Well. I had gotten to a point in my life where I wanted to do more, and I wasn't sure, like a lot of people. And then it hit me. And I'd like to just take a minute if I can, and uh, I'd like to paint you what happened. I'll move as quickly as I can. It doesn't take me long. I tell people, and I was 
laughing as Jeremy was doing his presentation. For those of you old enough, Jim Croce, he said he couldn't write it, so he sang it. I can't write it or sing it, fortunately for everybody here, so I'm just going to paint it quickly. Now this is what, what happened to me. I'll try to move as quickly as I can. Take a brief, I, I don't know if you can notice, do you notice how much better I feel? Yeah. <laughs> it's a hell of a way to have to get some relaxation in front of 500 people. <laughs> anyway, you do what you gotta do. Yeah. There it was. I got hit by a bullseye, I by a, a lightning bolt. The same lightning bolt that I've been waiting for 27 years to hit me, unrealistically, because there is no lightning bolt. But in this case, the lightning bolt came in the form of the Discovery Channel, who had done a documentary film that featured my story. My wife and I had given them complete access to our family for three days. Three days in the hope of, of putting a face on mental illness. Well, the first time we watched it three months later, you watch it and you hope they do a good job and we were very proud of it and I hope everybody here might have an opportunity to see that someday. But it was watching it the second time, the third time, perhaps the fourth, that I had almost out of body experience. And I had found my bullseye and I'd like to show you. There was, there was the bullseye. On the outside, I was the CEO of a company. And a pretty good CEO, I thought, but I can assure you there's better and they're, they're here in this audience. Marketing-based background, smaller. Artist, smaller. Mental illness suffer, really small. And I watched that video, I saw it, right there. Right in that bullseye, not despite, but because, because of my illness. I felt that I was uniquely qualified to carry a message of hope for mental illness and articulate it and communicate it in a way perhaps that someone hadn't found the way yet to. Well, I also knew that there was a huge opportunity. The opportunity you see behind me. One in four people are living with a diagnosable mental illness in the United States. Schizophrenia, bipolar, depression, anxiety, PTSD, Autism, I can go on and on. There isn't a single person in the audience today, I can assure you, that is not touched in some way by mental illness. Two-thirds of us won't get the help we need or deserve due to stigma. And I thought to myself, how is that possible? How is that possible in the year 2010 that such a thing could be so prevalent? I didn't understand it. I didn't understand why or how you could go to a Hallmark store and you could buy a card for your dog, but you couldn't buy a card for me. Something was wrong with that. Well, in my humble opinion, nothing anybody had tried yet had worked. And it would take a different approach, an approach that hadn't been tried before to take on something of this magnitude. We would need somehow a vehicle to transform society's ability to talk and handle mental illness. For lack of a better term, we'd have to make mental illness cool. Not cool to have it, I can assure you it's not cool to have it, but cool to support it. And to do that, we came up with a model that we call wear, share, and experience. Above me, how was it possible? Every illness has something. There was a yellow bracelet. There was a pink ribbon. AIDS had a red campaign. Everybody had something. Everybody but 26% of the population 
and the tens and millions of people like myself who suffer in silence. So we devise this model, way of sharing experience. Every time somebody was wearing a product inspired by one of our artists, we were one step closer. Every time we were able to create a platform by which people could share their stories, share their stories and their connection to mental illness in a positive and celebratory way. And the third thing that we knew, we knew that if we, we knew there was an opportunity to help millions of people, like myself, find peace of mind through the arts. Seven years ago, I had painted this image behind me. At the time, it was deeply personal. It stood for peace of mind and love in your heart, the combination of two very simple icons. Today, as I'm in front of you, it's, it's my dream that this symbol that you see right here will do for mental illness what Livestrong has done for cancer. Four years ago, I started this journey hoping to inspire a world to action. Today, that is fast becoming a reality as individuals, corporations, entrepreneurs, students, and others who understand the magnitude of the problem and the opportunity at hand to do something of true significance in our world. And I've never been more confident that that's becoming a reality than as I stand in front of this type of audience at BIF today. So I thank you. Peace, love is possible because of all of you. Thank you.